each and every Sunday here and worship his name on high. Well, again, like I mentioned before, it's great to be back. And I wanted to thank Josh again for covering I. When he walked in the door, I called him Mr. Braveheart from that uh, sermon from, from this past week. But uh, I, I, I watched it and it was a great job, Josh. So uh, thank you for doing that. So on Easter, we finished up our Mark sermon series with the resurrection, right? Uh, that was how the chapter ended. And that was just the best thing to do with looking at Mark and ending with the resurrection, the hope that we have, and what the resurrection brings us. Uh, with, with the Gospel of Mark and, of course, celebrating Easter. But today we start a brand new sermon series looking at the book of First Thessalonians. Use the other one. I don't see the other one. Oh, so that's forward. This is forward. All right. First Thessalonians, here we are. And I think it's going to be a great study, right? looking at a healthy church here, uh, celebrating the faithfulness of Christ and, and the believers here that we meet, uh, practical godly living for ourselves, and of course, the challenge to keep pressing on and living out the gospel in which we see. Well, I'm no architect or I'm, not, I'm no engineer or builder of any kind, uh, but I want us to think about first of how helpful it might be to have a small 3D model of something and have that be the model of our end goal of what we're trying to make here. And in this example here, we have a house, right, with the green rooftop, and it looks like a patio area there, and the nice windows there. So the architect looks at the model for reference, right, to see the vision of what they are building, and most importantly, copying the model and having that translate into real life. Right? For example, of course, you know, making sure that the dimensions are right, even making sure that the color of the roof and the sidings are all correct. These are the tasks in which an architect must be able to perform. Again, this is why a small 3D model can be the best type of model as a reference point to make sure that the architect here is on task. And way back in Acts chapter 17, you meet Paul and Silas, right? They, Paul and Silas, they travel to a synagogue in Thessalonica. And some of the folks there were per, uh, persuaded by the message of Jesus, okay? They bought into the gospel. They put their faith in Christ. And the message of Christ being the Messiah, that he was crucified on their behalf, okay? They accepted that because of the teaching that Paul and Silas were doing. But little did Paul and Silas know that these specific believers here would be the best model for other believers some other churches that were being established to look at and to emulate. This model here of the church in Thessalonica, in the very first chapter here, Paul gives us a thanksgiving for them and even uses that word model or uses that word example, in depending on your translation, to describe them and describe their faithfulness to the gospel. So Paul is using this language of modeling after and looking at these specific believers that accepted Christ based on his teaching and his preaching. So let's look at this very first chapter here. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to be reading the whole chapter here. It's only 10 verses. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Apostle Paul writes, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and the steadfastness and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, 
but your faith in God has gone forth elsewhere, so that we need not to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay, okay. Well, to start, I, I think this book would have been more than likely one of the earliest letters that Paul had written. Probably around 50 AD is what most scholars say, give or take maybe a few years earlier, a few years later. And I, get, I can't help but to think what, what Paul is writing this letter, he's thinking about his time spent in Thessalonica, right? He's thinking about the specific faces and names of the people that he ministered to. He's thinking about his time there, the culture, maybe even the food that he ate there. I don't know, but he's thinking back to the short time that he was there. And like I mentioned, the time that he was spent here is recorded in Acts chapter 17. So if you want to read that sometime this week, uh, I would really encourage you to do so. But we get deeper into this First Thessalonians passage uh, it's good to, to know what went on in Acts chapter seven and I, 17, and I'll summarize that uh, when Paul was there, because again, Paul was thinking about these memories, he was thinking about these times that he was with them while he was writing this letter, okay? So Thessalonica would have been a city of around 100,000 or 150,000, give or take, so think like a, a South Bend or Evansville, this isn't a Wanamaker kind of city here, this is a little bit bigger. Okay, so think of those two cities in Indiana, South Bend, Evansville, and this is a city that would have been very much influenced by Greek culture, okay, and very much influenced by the Romans, again, who was occupying this area here when, when Paul and Silas got there, um, and they were able to lead both Jews and Greeks alike to Christ, which formed this first, first ecclesia, that word ecclesia is Greek for church, or assembly of a local gathering. So this first ecclesia was started here in Thessalonica because of Paul and Silas' preaching here. And that's really who this letter is concerning, is those believers who are still there. Um, and these believers are the receivers of Paul's letters, right? But, but the story of Paul's time with these believers isn't over because in Acts chapter 17, Verses 7 and 8, uh, we see that the believers, they say they're acting against the decrees of Caesar, okay? Saying that there's another king named Jesus. And even in verse 8, it says the people in the cities were disturbed when they heard these things. So the rumor is that these people, the rumor across the city is that these people are defying Caesar as king by saying we serve another king. His name is is Jesus. And the people were disturbed by this reality. So do we see that Paul got these believers into, because of their new allegiance to King Jesus, they're accusing them of defying the physical king. But because of that, they were persecuted. And this persecution was so massive that Paul and Silas had to actually cut their time short. They had to leave quicker than they anticipated. And I'm sure this would have been very hard for Paul and Silas, because I imagine in the short amount of time that they were there, they were able to make good connections. They were able to form a special bond with the people here that was created. A love was formed for the people who lived in Thessalonica. And I want us to think about the reality when we look here. Here we are, Paul, right? Now writing to these saints, writing to these saints, thinking back to his time that he was with them. Thinking about the memories, thinking about the good times, but also maybe some of the bad times of having to be persecuted, having to cut their time short. Okay, these are the things in his mind while he's writing this letter. Now, a lot of Paul's letters start out with some type of form of thanksgiving. Thanks be to God. And what, made, what makes this specific chapter and this specific letter so special is, again, it's thanks to God. It's a special thanks and a praise to God. So Paul is thankful, first and foremost, for God and also this group of people. Thank you, God, for blessing me, the opportunity to meet these people. But it's a praise of God. It's a praise of who he is in his almighty holiness. It's a praise to the one true God and the sincere love that comes with it. And for Paul, he includes them in his thanksgiving. Okay, this is important here. 
we see that this duo here of praising God and praising God for these people, he mentions them in his prayer. That's what it says there, is that he thinks about them. He names them in his prayers, these believers here in Thessalonica. And that there has to be a reason here that's bigger than just having a tight bond with Paul that makes these Thessalonians worthy of such praise and such thanksgiving to God. Okay, there has to be something a little bit bigger here. And I think simply the Thessalonians' journey started with a deep, authentic faith that led them to good works. And faith that Jesus of Nazareth came into the world, died upon a cross for our sins. And because of that reality, it led them to good works. Okay, and with such a name like Grace Church that we have here today, I'm sure it's no secret after attending here for years that we know our salvation isn't by good works. But instead, as a result of God's grace through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, as Ephesians 2 puts that, right, saved by grace through faith. Okay, so I'm not saying here that the Thessalonians were believing a works-based salvation or any of that. No, no, no. They had faith in Christ, but what made it special was that faith, that authentic, that authentic faith that had authenticity led them to produce good works. So if salvation isn't by works, why would Paul be thankful for their work? And because the Thessalonians aren't working for salvation, they aren't working for any type of legalistic idea, they aren't doing good just for the sake of doing good, but no, they're good words, they're loving one another, they're, they're, they're living up moral lives, they're doing this because of one reason, because of their faith. But again, we, we read in James, and we're not going to go into the James passage, but we know that the root of justification is by faith. Okay, We're saved by faith. But then the fruit of that faith, the fruit of that justification, is living out the reality of the gospel, to live out our salvation. And that is what the Thessalonians are doing here. And isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't it a beautiful thing that... We can see here that we as a church, that would hope that we would want to strive for more of putting our faith in Christ, crossing that bridge from death to life, but then having results be shown. It's not just words on paper. It's not just an old story from long ago, but it truly changes our hearts and our lives. That is exactly why Paul is so thankful to the Thessalonians, because he sees the reality of what went on. Having faith that is grounded in Jesus Christ and his atonement on the cross leads doing good works for others. I mean, the gospel calls us to do this, right? To leave the old way of thinking and to live this newness of life, loving God and loving others, living for God and living for others. And this is called sacrificial love. And if you remember from two weeks ago, Easter, that, that sacrificial love was displayed in the utmost highest through the death and resurrection of Christ, who again is our blessed hope. And our eternal, steadfast, lasting hope, this never spoils, this never fades, this is a true reality thing. It's not a fleeing moment. This is an ongoing battle. This is an ongoing reality in which we live in the lives and the hearts of those who have trusted Christ as Savior. Thessalonians are a great model for our church right here. And we've started with the, with the big model of, um, of the little house there. But we could say that the Thessalonians are our model, and it's just a big picture right here. We're living here in 2023. We're living here uh, in, this, in this beautiful community that God has given us, this land. Now we have the opportunity to live out this in our life. Thessalonians, our model now, even too, to live out this. And they're a great model for us because their work was grounded in faith, and their labor was in love, just as the text tells us. And that was caused by having an authentic relationship with Christ, right? Their works were only prompted by faith, love, and hope, okay? Those were the three things we started with with our welcoming here. And you saw a slide a little bit ago, that faith, love, and hope is a great model of Thessalonians lived out and can be our model here today. And I want to go back here. Ooh. I want to go back here to verse 5, back to our text here. Uh, and in verse 5, it says, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power 
and the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Okay, I want to think about that for a second here. Because I believe the power of the gospel leads us to not hear, but do. Right? I think in James here, he says we, we don't want to be just hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. So what Paul is trying to get at here in First Thessalonians and, and looking at this model, looking at these believers, looking at how they lived out their faith, is that they themselves heard it with their words, okay? Not just words, but also the truth of the gospel came to them in power, power of the Holy Spirit. What an incredible thing here. And I look out to my congregation here today, and, and I see a lot of folks who have attended church for many years. And maybe if you haven't attended this specific church, you've grown up in another church that preaches Christ and, and preaches good, solid Christian doctrine. And my question is, what kind of influence has that had on your life? Has it made you lazy? Well, it shouldn't have. It should have led to transformation, right? The transformation power of the gospel first leads us to be convicted of our sin and then calls us out of that sin into the saving knowledge of Christ that brings about joy and peace in our hearts and in our lives. Okay, so this transformation then leads to action. Okay, and again, if you think about your time back at church over the years, all the different times you've heard the gospel uh, in, it, in its physical observant form, like a man, like me preaching, right? You've heard the gospel being preached in front of you by a person, preaching from an old book, but it's not about the words. It's not about the book. It's about the power that comes with the words, the power that comes with the book that makes you dead in your sin to lie with Christ, make these stories transform you inwardly. It's not about some preacher preaching every Sunday. It's about the words that have the power to change your heart to your life, the Holy Spirit that can come into your life and to transform you. And man, if I could start believing that, I wouldn't be so nervous every Sunday morning to preach, right? Because my sermons don't have to do with me. Me standing up here and preaching isn't a show or some kind of performance that I do or put on. Instead, it's God using my words, using these illustrations, using his word to convict us and to transform our hearts and our lives to himself and his eternal purpose. This is why it's so important to preach from the Bible, right? to let the Bible speak for itself. And I'm sure a, a verse that comes to my mind, and I'm sure a verse that we've heard before is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 16, right? The all scripture is God breathed, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Think about that last verse, that last phrase, training in righteousness, to live out our faith. Think of an athlete training for a competition or a half marathon as I'm doing next week. Okay, you put in time, you put in effort, you train. Well, that's what the word of God is to do, for us to do, to train us, to mold us, to have, to be stronger than we were the day before. Okay, so if we look back to our text here, it's not about coming in word, but in power. And that power can start and grow through reading God's word. And again, God's word will help us be trained in our righteousness. And Paul and Silas preach this transformational power of Christ through their words, which would transform the lives of these Thessalonian believers. They heard the word with their ears, but they responded with the transformation of their heart. I once had a professor in Bible college. He would hold up the Bible like this, and he would say, this book is not a textbook. I still remember him saying this. This book is not a textbook. This book has the power to transform your mind, your heart, and your life okay the word of god has power to it we don't just hear with our ears they don't just come in word like we see on paper it has the power to transform our lives so why isn't the bible just a textbook it has power to it, it has transforming power each and every day to change how we think to change how we act to change how we treat others that is the evident power of the bible and isn't that so true right the word of god preached by mouth, preached by word, has the power to literally convict us of our sin, to change our life when we put our faith in Christ as the one who died on, our, on the cross for our sins. And the Holy Spirit, of course, baptizes us into Christ, and we have a new identity. That new identity is in Christ, because that is how God sees us. 
Okay. And the Thessalonians here responded in such a way, and Paul recognizes their change. Again, not because of words, but instead of power and conviction of the Holy Spirit through the words and the faith. And the gospel had power to change them. And if the gospel had power to change them, we would know about it. We certainly know here today the gospel has the same power to change our hearts and our lives. And a big point in Paul writing this letter was to not only remind them of their faith, as we talked about in, in the earlier part of us passage here in the beginning, it's not just to remind them of their faith and their steadfastness, but also the amount of it. be an example for the rest of the world. He named those two cities there and, and, how, and how they became, the Thessalonians became the model for those people's faith. And here today, we're still reading about these believers in Thessalonica as a model for us to be able to see how they live their lives. They weren't afraid to say, we worship King Jesus over King Caesar. They weren't afraid to go into the, the cities and to face the persecution which lied ahead of them. They had that firmness in the gospel. They had that hope that came to them the preaching and word by mouth of Paul and Silas, who was their first really pastor or teacher there at, in their church. And I want us to go back here to, to, to reread uh, re verses uh, 6 through 8. And you become imitators of us, of the Lord, right? You receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example, the believers in Macedonia, and Nikaya, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not to say anything. So again, even though they were in affliction, even though they were in hardship, even though they were in persecution, Thessalonians remained imitators of the faith that Paul and Silas lived out. And they were reminding them of that example, reminding that they, that they're, testimony, their influence, how they lived their lives, influenced others. They became imitators of them. And that's quite the responsibility. And it's quite the responsibility and, and humbleness to know that there are believers around the world that maybe I haven't even met yet that are living their lives for Christ because of how I behaved. That's humbling. That is, that is amazing how God can use their actions to influence the world around them. Their faith was unshaken. And it was inevitable to all who saw. So I guess my, my question to all of us here at Grace Church here in Indianapolis here in 2023 is, do we want to be known with this type of faith? Right? Do we as a church want to be grounded in a faith that grows and grows and gets stronger and stronger in the difficult moments in life? And most importantly, do you want to be a church who has faith that is being known throughout our community? as faith which is grounded in love and hope of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope the answer is yes to all of that. Right? I hope the answer is yes. This is something that we want to strive to know Christ more, to be a witness, an example in our community, to bring forth love to our community, but also in truth and also in hope that Christ truly did die for our sins. And again, the Thessalonians' testimony, such a remarkable one, right? When Paul and Silas first met them, some served the Greek pagan gods, right? Some were so far from Christ. Well, others who maybe weren't from the Greek background, but maybe had, you know, strict Orthodox Jewish backgrounds, and they were so devoted to the law, so devoted to the customs and the teaching and the practices uh, around that, they were to turn away from that and turn towards the one true living God who sent their son, sent his son, Lord Jesus, to die on our behalf. Okay? Why it says they turned from their gods and devoted themselves to the one true God. They heard about Jesus Christ with their ears, transformed their hearts. Faith that leads to love and is grounded in hope, the Lord Jesus. Now that right there, church, is our model. And, but how can we live as transformed beings if we first haven't been transformed? And this is the real hope of the gospel. This is the, what the Thessalonians had their hope in. This is what we can continue and continually live out in our lives. Okay, so just as 
the Thessalonians, before they met Paul and Silas, they were all sinners. We know that we are all sinners. That Titus two pass, or sorry, Titus three passage that we read about earlier talked about being foolish, led astray, disobedient in every way, shape, or form. That says that when the kindness and the goodness of God came, let's let's take a step back there and look at the disobedience, looking at sinners, and we ourselves as sinners is because we have all sinned, because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. What is sin? Missing the mark of God's perfect standard of living. God's laws, God's decrees. We miss the mark. We have sinned. And on our own, there is no hope because there is no way that our sinful selves can ever be reconciled with a perfect and holy God of ourselves. The scriptures say that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So we have to go with the bad news first. The bad news is that we're sinners can do nothing about it. But the good news is that Christ died for sinners like us. All sinners, bad news, good news, Christ died for sinners. Amen. So what do we have to do? Faith, right? Faith is more than just believing. It's trusting. It's trusting what Christ has done for our sins, right? I'm reminded of if Hebrews chapter 11, the first just came to me. Now faith is confidence, what we hope for, and what we are assured of what we do not see, okay? Faith is grounded in the hope that we have and which we do not see, okay? But we know that Christ died for our sins. So my encouragement for us is put our faith in that message. Put our faith that as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried on the raised on the third day. Okay, that is the hope. That is what draws us into a relationship with Christ. And if you do this, you are saved. Right? The Bible tells us that we have a new creation. Crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And I think about back in Easter, looking at Romans chapter 6, looking at the power of the resurrection. Right, 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 We die with our sins as Christ died on the cross for our sins. When Christ was raised again, therefore we are now raised in the newness of life. Okay, this is the transformation that we see so evident in the Thessalonians. You see here, even in our local church here in Indianapolis, why we have testimonies, people coming up and seeing the transformational power. Okay, what does Romans chapter 8 verse 1 say? It says, there's no, therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation of that is your identity. You can't lose your salvation once you get that. It's a gift, a free gift. If you put your faith in him. Your identity is not no longer not in your sin. No longer in that disobedience that led astray. But now in Christ. And, and something that I've been thinking about lately. And I heard last week. But I've just been on my mind all week with the gospel. And the Christian life. And I guess the, the life apart from Christ is pick your heart. Now, I'll explain that in a second. Pick your heart. Okay, we have one aisle of the spectrum, which is, as the Thessalonians knew, your faith in Christ, the Christian journey, is a hard life. Okay, you're different from the world. You're enemies of the world. There's persecution. There's sometimes even death, physical hurt. There's jail time. There's torment. There's there's laughing. There, there, there's There's... Uh, there's so many things that are part of being a Christian. Waking up every day and pursuing a life that is apart from the world, that is a hard life to live. The Christian life is not easy. It is a hard life. Thessalonians are the best example. If you ever doubt that the Christian life is hard, ask the Thessalonians. So that's one eye of the spectrum. What's the other eye? Continuing in our sin? Living a life of sin where we're trying to find purpose and meaning in something that's fleeting, something that won't give us that eternal hope, something that we keep going to back and back and back again, something that I think in the Psalms described as a dog vomit, right? Going back and trying to, to taste what is good, but we know it's so bad. Trying to find purpose and identity in things that were never supposed to give us purpose and identity. Reclaiming it. Now, that is a hard circle to be living. That is so hard to continue living in sin and thinking that that is what it is. If it's drinking, if it's drugs, if it's sexual, whatever, 
that life is not going to be fulfilled. That's a hard life to live. So my question for us is pick your heart. Is it hard to be a Christian? Yes. Is it hard to be still dead in our sins, living a life of sin, trying to please ourselves, keep our flesh, trying to find joy and purpose in our sin? Yes, that's hard too. Pick your heart, but pick Christ. Because what the sinful life, the hard life, leads to is a life of destruction and no purpose and no joy. But the Christian life has joy, has purpose, has peace. Think about that. Even though the Christian life is hard, even though there is persecution and hardship, there still is joy and peace and identity that we can find because of Christ. Trust in Christ. He saves us from our sins. He saves us from the wrath to come. He'll replace that emptiness with joy. Let's go to the Lord this morning and pray. Father, again, we're so convicted by this reality and this truth. Father, we as a church, we want to be grounded in faith that leads to love that is centered in hope of your son, the Lord Jesus, coming to this world, dying on behalf of us and our sins. Father, we know that the Christian life is hard. We know that the Thessalonians face persecution, but they lived out the example by word and deed and example to the rest of this region. Father, we pray that we have an opportunity here with this church, with this land, with this building, to be that same example in our community, to live a life for the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of all the, the, the faces here this morning, the faces who are part of this church who may not be here this morning, who have been radically transformed by the gospel. They heard the gospel with their ears by a, by a man like myself, maybe behind a pulpit, but it's not about that. It's about what the truth of the gospel that came in power by the Holy Spirit, power that convicted them of their sin, power that led them on a life of righteousness apart from themselves. That same power is true in the word of God. That same power is alive and active everywhere we look in the church. We just pray that that continues to be magnified in the hearts and the lives of us here today. Father, again, we thank you and we praise you. In Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Troy.